Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Hug somebody's neck and tell them you're glad they are here. Thank you for joining us online or later on YouTube, wherever you are. But if you can get here, please get here. Merry almost Christmas, everyone. It's almost here. So, uh, man, join us next week for the Christmas, Christmas Eve service. It's going to be great. And then uh, to all my guys in the house, January 4th at 6.45 p.m., we're going to have a Becoming Man night. I think that's a Thursday night, 6.45 p.m. We're going to uh, kind of kick off 2024 with a Becoming Man night. So every dude in here, I would love to see you join us that night. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have some fun. Yes, I love excitement. Um, can you back off that a little bit, Wojo? Thanks, man, because I may get loud here in a little bit. I mean, it's, all, it's possible. It's how you know it's possible. All things are possible to those who, never mind. Anyway, so, all right, so several weeks ago, I want to uh, do a, a review with you guys. Um, if you've been with us the whole time, great. If you hadn't, you can go back and listen to all these, and um, I think they're super important to listen to them. So several, several, several weeks ago, how many can remember beyond last week? Anybody? A little bit? Kind of? Okay, so I'm take your brain back. How many, how many find it difficult to remember three weeks ago, but like when you're five, you can remember it? Okay, like you feel a little bit like Dory, short-term memory loss? Okay, so um, several, several weeks ago, we went over the uh, mission, vision, and core values of the church. We are one church unified to become kingdom men, women, and families. And we kind of started this journey on, here's, here's like, these things are loose, and then we tightened it down a little bit and tightened it down even more to like things that we have to absolutely agree on. And then um, from the mission and vision of the church, we went into ecclesiology, which is just the study of the church and its origin and function. Like what makes you a church? What do you have to do? What has to be a part of that? And then we went over the 11 theological essentials that we, we have to agree on if we call ourselves Christ followers. Um, you, can, <clears throat> you can disagree a little, like a little bit, just a little bit inside the study of the church, but like just a little bit. And we can disagree a lot in uh, mission, vision, and core values and all of that. But I did challenge, I said, listen, if you do, you wanna find a place that you line up with that because if you don't, you just won't, you eventually you won't like it. You'll be unhappy. And um, we want you to be full of joy and happy and moving along and growing. And then we jumped into some family converse, conversations. Uh, how many married people are in here? <laughs> yeah, love it. That's right, be glad that you are married. Look at your wife and your husband say, I love you, thank you for putting up with me. We talked about leaving and cleaving. Then we took a little bit of a break and Benet and Brianna talked about what child education would look like. And then Benet and I came back and we talked about the difference between a covenant, if I say covenant, and contractual marriage. And then we hit the appropriate male and female roles in marriage. And then we talked about family of origin, family of choice, why that's important, how the Bible talks about that. And then last week we talked about the Sabbath. Who enjoyed last week? Because I know you can remember last week, right? So if you, if you like, you might need to listen to that message again. There was a lot said in there, super, super deep about how we should view time and we should view the Sabbath and what it's actually, actually, what it's actually for. And so um, Benet and I were down in Louisiana at the first of the week. Can I just say Louisiana is a different place? <laughs> you know, you go through Mississippi and you're like, okay, I'm in Mississippi. And if you're from Mississippi, no disrespect, but Mississippi is different. And then you get to Louisiana and you're like, wow. Didn't know it could be more different. Like people just, they just, they just, they think a little special down, way down. So um, I don't even know how to explain that other than I went to a gas station and I'm almost never surprised by people's response to stuff. But I walked into a gas station in Louisiana and I went, I have no idea what she just said. <laughs> I don't even, don't even, it wasn't even close to the question I was asking. And I'm pretty sure she was speaking at tongues in part of it. I was like, uh, I just said, you know what, thank you, <laughs> and just went on. So we were in Louisiana, had a great time, got to interact with some people. But what, what I want to encourage you and, and kind of what I want to use to start off this conversation is, is always be aware that you're never anywhere that God doesn't want to use you. Like you're, 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 you're not like you're in Publix, Walmart, wherever you are, like be attuned to what the spirit would want to use you to do in somebody else's life or what he would want to use that person to do in your life. Um, and so it's never like a one way street. And so we're there in several, what we call divine appointments. Divine appointments are where you sit down talking to somebody and it all, like it immediately goes to a God conversation, like out of nowhere. Um, so Benet had this conversation. We were out by the little fire pit area and this lady walked up and she was talking to her and 
she, B'nai was just, just very kind of said, well, like, um, are you here with your husband? So are you from here? She said, no, I'm not from here. Are you here with your husband? She's like, well, yeah. And then she said, oh my gosh, I can't lie to you. I'm not here with my husband. I'm having an affair. And we've been having an affair. Here's what we're doing. This is why, I, like, just unloaded on B'nai. And listen, you may think, oh man, that person, like, can't control themselves. No, the spirit was there and things started to unfold. And the truth is, this lady desperately wants to be free. And she's gotten herself in a situation that she knows way, no way out. And Benet, Benet just loved on her and prayed with her. And, and they're staying in contact. And um, it's going to be very powerful, the future is. And we had several, several moments with like that. And here's what I will tell you. The more that we, and I mean we as a, as a church family, interact with people, we need to understand that people are broken. And they are desperate for the real thing. And they just, they just want it. And, and listen... These people we're interacting with either were raised in the church or are currently going to the church, but they have no base or foundation to which to function from. They've been going to church their whole life. They know all the Jesus answers, but yet they've gotten themselves in a very precarious situation where they, they don't even know how they got there. Why? I think a lot of times the longer you're doing something, you believe that fundamentals are elementary. I know I have. I've taken things for granted that I used to do when I got started. How I many when you start something new, there's some things you have to do to just be that thing. Like it's, this is the fundamentals. Here's how you start. Here's what's required. And you start doing that. And then you, you feel like, oh, I'm good enough. I don't, I don't have to do the fundamentals. Let me say fundamentals. Fundamentals are never elementary, meaning you never graduate from the need to practice and maintain fundamentals. Like it's, it's, ne it's never okay. It's never like, oh, I can take that out and I'll be okay because I'm here now. That's not necessary. Fundamental from a definition, definition standpoint means being the foundation of forming a necessary base or core of central importance. Unknown to you, I started a series that we're still in. And we're just covering the base I'm not going to make assumptions that just because you've been going to church for 20 years or you've been with us for 17, that you're still practicing or understanding the fundamentals. Mission, vision, core values. What is the church? What are the 11 essential? What does that mean? We can't argue about them. We have to obey them. Theological essentials. What, are, what does marriage look like scripturally? What does our roles as male and female look like? What, like if I say Fundamentals. Just straight fundamentals. And if at any point in this, this series of conversations that we've had in our little small group here, you felt like, ah, I got that. You might want to make sure if you got it, it is part of your everyday practice and mental focus. Because if it's not, then you might want to revisit it. Even people who play at the highest level in sports will tell you, the thing that keeps them playing at the highest level is they never forsake fundamentals. That it's always the base of what they're doing. And out of all the interactions that we have had over just the last couple of weeks in doing what we do, and the fact that we now have the opportunity to um, be marriage coaches, I'm just telling you, correct me if I'm wrong, babe, we, we spend at least the first three months with a married couple just going over the fundamentals of marriage. I'm talking people that have been married 10, 15, 20 years, and they keep revisiting the same problem. And it's, it's I mean, I'm not in it, so it's easy for us to see. How I many you know when you're not in the problem, you're like, well, there's the answer, man. Just, let's do that. And it, it is, and listen, here's what's crazy. They argue with us. No, that's not the problem. I'm like, do you, do you realize you're paying me to tell you what the problem is? Like, if you don't want my advice, like, for sure, just, just come hang out. Don't write me a check. But they, like, argue, like, no, that's not it. I'm like, I'm telling you, that's it. Like, you're not loving each other. You're not living a selfless life. You don't understand the power of marriage. You don't really know that you're a prophet, priest, king, and warrior, and that you're a helpmate fit for him to protect his heart and lungs. No, that's not. I got that. Yeah, but you're mean to each other, so you ain't got something. Fundamentals. I promise you, if you're in here and you're married and you only practiced the fundamentals, 
you'd have the most beautiful marriage ever. We practice that every single day. Number one fundamental in marriage, die to self. And if you're like, no, that's not it. Well, you're not dying to self right now. You're arguing with me. No, it can't be it. I'm telling you, it's it. How many, know, how many in here married people know you can be selfish? If they need help, spouse, look at them and go, okay, just give them the, un, y'all know the nonverbal communication that we have with marriage is like the look. How many know you got the look? How many have the look with your kids? You got the look. Listen, we all can get there. And I'm just telling you, as we start this conversation today, about 10 things every Christian should know and maintain. 10 things. You've got to understand that fundamentals are the most important thing you'll ever do. But you have to consistently, constantly, forever, practice and maintain those. So 10 things. If I was sitting across from you and you scheduled an appointment to come have counseling with your pastor and I sat down and you said, man, just tell me the things I need to just consistently do to have the life that I want. I would go over all those other things that we've been in a series to do, but I would tell you these 10 things. These are 10 things. And I thought and thought and thought and thought, like, what would I, what would I tell people? Fundamentally, you need to understand. I'm not talking about putting anything to practice. We can get there, but you need to understand. Look at your neighbor and say, understand this. Number one, God is love. I think we forget that. First John chapter four, verse seven, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God loves you. If you think not me, God hates me, God's mad at me because the devil has got you to focus on the circumstances, then you're, that's what you're going to believe. And I'm just here to tell you that's not true. God loves you so much so that he came to die for you. I think we forget that. I think we get to running and we want to study some deep theological concept and look up some big words and look at the original language and what's this Hebrew word say? What's this Greek word say? Well, if you do that out of the context that God is love, you're going to be very confused. The fundamental is that God loved you so much that he came to die for you. The next thing I think we forget is this. <clears throat> God exists in three persons. If I say the Trinity, that's... Listen, the word Trinity, is, I got a, last time we talked about this, I got an email. You need to know Trinity is not in the Bible. I know that. But it is a word that we have developed from a theological stance to describe an indescribable God. How many of you know, you know that? Like, yes, he is three persons, but he is all one. And you're like, oh, we're going to think of the egg, the shell, the yolk, the outer part, all that. Like, that's... Ice, water, water, ice, steam, water. Like, that's like God. No, none of that's like God. All that falls short. None of that works. Why? But because he's three, but yet one. Eternally. The first of the Godhead is God the Father. Has several names in the Hebrew. They call him a lot of things, but here's what you need to know. He is the beginning and the end. He is eternal. He has always been, which is why his first naming is I am. It is a continuation being. You are what? That's the next question, right? I am. No, that's it. I am. The second person of the Godhead is Jesus, the Savior of the world, God in flesh to walk among us, to communicate who God is, to exemplify God's heart to all humanity. The third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit, which in John 14, Jesus said, if I go, I will send a helper. Everybody say helper. He, that is your eternal counselor, encourager, empowerment, helper. Whenever you get in trouble, you need words to say, you need power to get through something, you just need to relax lie on Holy Spirit. How many times you forgot that in a situation? And you feel like it's all on me. I got to try real hard. Ah, you got to submit real good, but you don't have to try so hard. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are all three persons, but yet are God Almighty. 
I think we forget that. I think we don't keep that as a fundamental state of our understanding that God is love, that God exists in three, three persons. And this one, God forgives. Man, how many of us struggle with that? We did something last week and we go, man, I don't know if God got this one. I gotta figure out how to make this up. I gotta figure out how to fix this. Well, that's because each and every man, woman, child, everybody born into the world is born under the first Adam's disobedience, which means we're born into sin. But 1 John 3, 5 says, Jesus came to take away our sins, yet there was no sin in him. Jesus removed the sin barrier. And because of what Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection, it's important. We don't just stop at the cross. If we did, we're out the cross and the resurrection, then we are now alive. Our sins are like all the bad stuff that you have done, you are doing, or you will ever do is forgiven under the blood of Jesus. Colossians 2, 13 through 14, God made you, I say me, alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. You're forgiven. But what about, that's under the blood. Yeah, but under the blood, I, th I honestly think we forget that. Or maybe we take it for granted, which is, why the, which is why Paul writes in Galatians, do not use the grace of God as a license to sin. But even if you did, if you just, how many of you ever done something said, this is just, grace is just gonna have to get this one? Anybody? Anybody ever said something to somebody before you said it? He was like, calling the grace card on this one, Jesus, but I'm saying it. <laughs> that's, what that, that's what that verse is talking about. It's when you know I'm about to sin and I just go ahead and tell the Lord, grace has got to cover this one because I'm doing it anyway. Even then, God, even then, God will forgive. Why? Because God is love. And, and Andy's in three persons and he's loving you and he's counseling you. And he forgives. And he forgives because the next thing I think we forget is that God has a plan for you. That God has a plan for if, if you have ever read the Bible at all, you need to know that from Genesis to Revelation, it is about God's plan, but also our interaction with him in his plan. He has a plan for you to be involved in his plan. I heard a, a communicator say, which I thought was very profound. I never thought of it this way. Um, it's challenging even the way I read the word now because I'm growing just like you're growing. He said, you know, too many people read the scriptures and they, they say, God, what do you want to say to me? And he said, that's a very selfish way to enter into the scripture. He said, he said this because if it doesn't, if you read the Bible that way, here's what kind of struck me. God, what do you want to say about to me, you're, you're saying, I want the word to serve me and fix my anxiety problem, my depression problem, my sin problem, my lust problem, my whatever problem. God, say something to me to fix me. He's that selfish and self-serving in nature instead of, God, what do you want to say that I need to align to? What are you saying? What have you always been saying? And he said this, which is actually in some ways true. The Bible's not actually written to you. It's written about God. Think about that. I've said it, and I, and I, I still kind of believe it. It's, it's God's love letter to us. It's God's instruction manual to us. I got that. But to, but to actually step in and embrace, man, you know what? It's not written to me to solve my problems. It's written about God to get in his kingdom. You know what happens when I remember all these fundamentals and I'm in his kingdom, like I remain in him, he remains in me. Do you know what automatically happens? I don't really have that many problems. Anxiety does go away. Depression does go away. Well, how do you know that? Well, Jesus said, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you'll bear much fruit. What is that? Oh, that's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Y'all get the deal, right? So God has a plan for you and it's for good, not evil, is what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. The next one that we forget is God speaks to us. Do you know God talks to you? 
We don't often pay attention to it. We don't often submit to it. We don't often have a conversation. But John 10, 27 says, Jesus speaking, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. The reason we don't hear God speak is because we don't create space for him to speak. You have to learn to shut the noises of the world out, the noises of your mind. How many know your mind is noisy? And you got to get in a space, a place to create a moment in time where you just allow God to talk to you. And to do that, you got to stop talking. A lot of us spend our time with God talking. And I'm not saying it's not good. Maybe you are thanking him. Maybe you're not complaining. But what if you just sit in silence? And the only thing you said when you went into that space was, God, I'm here to, I'm in this place to hear from you. And you just went quiet. I think we forget. God speaks to us. Next one is our words matter. Look at your neighbor and say, your, word, your words actually matter. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap its consequences. Now, when I say that, those who love to talk will reap its consequences. How many of you think that's negative in nature? Just be honest, raise your hand. Okay, so that means it's gonna, if I talk too much, that's bad. That's actually not what that phrase means. Consequences are not good or bad. I've tried to teach you this. Consequences just are. What do you mean? Well, if you speak life, you reap the consequences. What you sow, you shall also Okay. There is power in the tongue of life or death. When you talk, you're going to reap those consequences. So let me ask you this. How often do you spend speaking life? And how often do you spend speaking death? So like I said last week, I'm not saying don't, don't recognize the, the issues you have to kind of deal with, but there is a way to enter into those opportunities kingdom-minded and with a kingdom tongue, or you can enter in and, and really make it hell based on what you're saying and what you're thinking. Our words matter. And most, a lot of us, we'll say most of us, but a lot of us, a large portion of us, we are in a world that our words have created. See, the world doesn't give you what you want. It gives you who you are. If you're ever wondering, why, why is this so much chaos around me? Well, it may be because you're speaking death all the time and thinking it and you're causing it and you're creating it. And if you just back up a little bit and choose joy and go, okay, all right. It feels fake. How many of you ever, how many of you ever try to be positive for one day and go, this is the fakest thing on the planet? This, I am, like, listen here. I have no disrespect. I actually love Joe Osteen because he has stated over and over and over again, his, his calling in life is to be a voice of hope. And too many people give that dude down the road for whatever reason, and I'm just not into that. I appreciate who he is. And some people go, well, I can, if I smile all the time and I'm not Joe Osteen, that's what you'll say. Or I'm, picture the most joy-filled person in your life and you just go, well, I'm just not them. You're right. Because you hasn't chosen to be. You can be joy-filled. You can be like, and listen, I'm not like positive for positive sake. That's not it. Have a yes mindset. All the promises in God are yes and amen. Like step into that power and that authority and have a great day. Tomorrow could be the greatest day if you just choose for it to be. Like, well, there's too many uncontrollables. I got it. But when, when, something, when something bad comes your way, because bad things, Jesus said, storms are coming. I mean, you read that. Okay, storms are coming. When something bad comes your way, just, just flip it. And instead of saying, why me? Why God didn't you? I don't understand. I prayed. You didn't answer. Just go, man, as a result of this, what opportunity does this give me that I didn't have before? Look at your neighbor and smile. Because tomorrow you're going to step into kingdom authority. And when it goes bad, what, what opportunity does this give me now? When you get stuck, we say this all the time, when you get stuck on 565 on your way to Huntsville, and it, you're like, this is terrible. It, all of a, how many know it gets hot all of a sudden? <laughs> Everybody knows it's a temperature change in your car. Immediately when you come, come to a stop and you're looking down the road, and it's like all the red lights. You're like, oh my God, why is it so hot in here all of a sudden? You have to roll the window down. Okay, what that is, is your anxiety, your, your frustration, your anger, your body temperature is going up. Listen, listen, just go, okay, what opportunity does this give me that I didn't have before? Oh, I can turn some worship music on. Oh, I could pray. Oh, I could get started on that book that I've been meaning to read for the last 10 years of my life. 
right? I mean, all kinds of opportunities open up the once you, you change your mindset. But we, for, we forget that our words and our thoughts, because that's where our words come from, actually matter. The next thing I think we forget, and we, like, we remember it when we sing about it, but we don't live like Jesus is coming back. We forget. He's coming. Look at your name. Say, he's coming back. Now look, look at him go, for real. Like it's not, it's not like maybe one day, hope so. No, he's coming back. I got it, but nobody knows. I'm... I'm aware. Even Jesus said, I don't even know when I get to come back. Only the Father knows. But he's going to, Matthew says he's going to send his angels out. It's going to be a sound of a trumpet. And he's coming back to gather those that are his. And there's going to be some stuff that goes down. It's not going to be so good for some people. But he is absolutely coming back. So we need to live in a way of not, I hope you get them but in a way of urgency for others and celebration for us. Let me say that again. Live in a way for urgency for others and celebration for us. Because he is coming back, and it's going to be awesome. I challenge you to look at the historical change of art over time of the depiction of Jesus returning. In the early church days, it was all sunshine and rainbows. Go look. Blue skies, white clouds. He's like, looks happy. All the, like they, you know, they paint the picture of the people floating in the air. All those people are happy. And for some reason through time, they started painting dark skies and death and fire and this terrible idea that Jesus is coming back. But yet in the early church, it was like, man, Jesus is coming back. Now it's like, man, Jesus is coming back. Hope you're ready. No, I hope you're ready, but like Jesus is, there's, it's a different idea. And he is. The next one that matters is your faith. You're going to say your faith matters. Faith, Hebrews 11 says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Our everyday life and the enjoyment of it and the power in it is a result of our faith in God. So faith Matters. Faith matters so much, it's the decision-making point of whether you're in the kingdom or you're not. It is by faith you are saved, and it's by grace you are saved through faith. Through. That's the doorway to salvation. So obviously, it matters. Don't forget that your faith matters. The Holy Spirit matters. The Holy Spirit matters because Acts 1-8 says, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I heard somebody say that I know we're all supposed to evangelize. That's not true. Evangelism is a gift. So don't feel like you got to be the person that can walk up to anybody and like give them the rundown of the gospel. Okay? I, it would be nice if you can when they ask you the question. That's where the Bible says always be ready to give an answer for your faith. Okay? But... You're, everybody in this room is not an evangelist. But everybody in this room is a witness. Which means you walk different, you talk different, you act different, you think different, and you do that in the power of the Holy Spirit where people notice, you, they witness that, and then they come to you and they say, man, what's up? And you tell them Jesus. And you, maybe you're like, but I, I'm not really sure. I don't have a question. Just come with me Sunday. And when they get in here, the Bible instructs us in Corinthians that our worship is so powerful that it, it like shows people their sin and they get saved in worship before I ever say a word. Wouldn't that be crazy? Well, that requires us being witnesses that people would actually want to come hang out with us. I'm not saying that you're not that. I'm just saying we, that's what we have to do. All right, last one. My favorite. I forget this sometimes, so I know you forget it sometimes. We are heirs and partners with Jesus. We are a part of Jesus' heritage. We are heirs and partners with Jesus. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Jesus. What does that mean? Everything Jesus has, I get. I think you forget that. I think most of us forget 
all 10 of these things and our life is filled with anxiety, depression, stress, tension, striving, because we just don't rest in the reality, the 10 reality of these fundamentals. Somebody's like, can you break it to two? I mean, 10, that's a lot to remember, Pastor. I mean, psychologically, you only remember seven numbers in succession if you're average. So like, give me two. Okay, I'll give you two. Write these two down. If I was just going to give you two, write these two down. Everybody be putting out a pen, get your phone out, write these two down. I'm looking at people, you're not doing anything, I'm going to wait. He's like, you didn't come here to go home the same, okay? Now listen, I can start voluntolding you because I can see all of you. This is the greatest part about sitting in the center. I am not blinded, I can see, okay? All right, number one, God is love. Remember that one. The next one. This is the one we just went over. You are heirs and partners with Jesus. You are a child of God. Jesus is your friend, but he's also your brother through the adoption of his blood from his crucifixion and resurrection. That makes you significant. Don't think too highly of yourself than you should, but with sober judgment. Judge yourself, but look here. Don't think too lowly of yourself, then you should. You are a child of God. You are joint heirs with Jesus. You have been gifted and talented and empowered to be a witness for Christ. And God loves you no matter what. Remember those two things and tomorrow will be radically different. If you decide to forget or you become unaware, something's gonna go sideways. Promise fundamentals are not elementary. You never graduate from not needing to understand these 10 things. Go, everybody's got their 2024 plan. I, I encourage you, get these 10 things as your foundation and don't ever forget them and don't ever not mentally think about them or practice them and maintain them. And 2024, will be an unbelievable year in your life, in your marriage, in your school, in your company, in whatever arena that you wish improvement would happen. It'll happen if you get your base right. That thing you want to be healed of, get your base right, probably be healed of it. And let me say this, if you're not miraculously healed of it, immediately you know what you want, you won't care. You won't care because you're so kingdom focused. And you so know you're loved by God that I'm healed already. And everybody's like, yeah, but you still have it. But I know I'm healed already. That's a witness to the power of God. So I don't know who's closing, but I'm going to pray for you. Hope today was informative. Hope you uh, have enjoyed this series of fundamentals, things you just need to know. If, if you want to take like the next week, two weeks and go back and listen to all of them, I highly recommend that you do it because I just gave you fundamentals for all those weeks. So 2024 is going to be amazing, guys. I bless you in the name of Jesus to walk in power and identity in Christ in 2024. But let's join together next week and just have a killer time celebrating the birth of Jesus. Deal? Yeah. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you, God, that fundamentals are so important when we never graduate from needing to practice those and maintain them. So God, bless these people under the sound of my voice. Bless me and my family as we move forward into 2024 to see greater things happen as we surrender our lives even more to you and your kingdom ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.